of communications and marketing at Euro Pacific Capital. Andrew is co-author along with Peter of the illustrated economics book, How, How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes. Let's hear it for Andrew. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, nice crowd. Nice crowd. A couple of quick points before I start speaking on things that are more specific. Um, you know, speaking of, uh, of, of, uh, of liberty and not paying taxes, for the moment, a shout out to Bill. If anyone knows him, Bill, we should. My father. Still in jail for not paying taxes. So, he got a 13 year sentence and he's 83. He's got six years ago. Um, I just sent him a file and Kate Coble, hopefully that will work. But his spirits are good. If you want to write him a letter, you know him. He reads all his mail. He's at uh, Terre Haute uh, Federal Correction Institute in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, and he's there. Anyway, another uh, two points. Um, you know, you talked about our previous speaker talking about the articles of Confederation. And before you, you, you leap back into that, there is one thing. If you do study history, you will know one thing, certainly. That a power vacuum gets filled by a power. So you can you can you can eliminate as much you know government as you possibly can, but maintaining that is a challenge because as soon as there's no power, something's gonna come in and take it. And the last thing I'd say is uh, about freedom. Um, my favorite line about freedom in America was delivered by uh, Jack Nicholson in um, in uh, Easy Rider and, and it might have been had look I thought it was it might have been apocryphal. And the line is Americans love to talk about freedom, but if they ever see one, see someone who's truly free, it scares the shit out of them. And that's, that, that I think is a lot, unfortunately a lot more true than, than, than it'd like to be. Anyway, my name is Andrew Schiff. Um, I'm Director of Communications with Euro Pacific Capital, which is an investment firm. I'm based here in New York City. Um, a lot of you may know my brother, Peter Schiff. He, he's been on TV a couple of times. Um, he's on the internet. I think, I think if you, you might find him, you go to the YouTube internet and you type his name in, you might find him here too. Um, anyway, Peter, Peter's not here today, he's out in DC. He's, he's going to a wedding, but also, this is very interesting, on Tuesday, day the, uh, on Tuesday of this week, he is testifying before the House Subcommittee on Government Reform and Stimulus Oversight. It's a big committee. Not too many members, but long names. Um, and he's testifying on the subject of job creation. Uh, and he was invited by the committee chairman, Jim Jeffers. Um, Jeffers, I think it's his name. Uh, which is a very brave act. And I hope to hear Peter's testimony, although he's not going to read from the script, I'm sure. And uh, the testimony is pretty blunt. And uh, I'm sure words of, those of that ilk were never before uttered in the halls of the U.S. Congress. But basically he's saying, look, you want to create jobs in America, first of all, you gotta, you know, we gotta get the hold of our fiscal policy and our monetary policy, and you, you know what that's all about. And I'm the only person to talk about that tonight, about how we, just, we have to, uh, you know, restore sound money, we have, we have to eliminate this overhang of federal deficit that we're directing all money away from the private sector and into the public sector. But he also talked about employer freedoms. And this is the big thing, you know, what he's gonna try to stress is that employee, uh, a, a, an employer doesn't lose rights when they hire somebody, and someone doesn't gain rights when they get a job. And there's plenty of laws in, on the books, um, in our criminal code, to protect an employer from an employee from any kind of criminal act of coercion. But there are mountains and mountains of regulations which, which give employees a club and, 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 and employers reason to fear hiring someone. And we're trying to say, look, if you want to, you want to make, if you want to increase employment, if you want to make people easier to hire, you've got to make them easier to fire, unfortunately. And you're going to be able to hire them without a lot of fear about what's going to happen to you and your business if you hire the wrong person. So, I mean, he's talking about getting rid of a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know regulation in the, in the workplace, and workplace safety, and workers' comp, and, get, and, mandated, man, and mandated benefits, and, and uh, disability, um, disability laws, and anti-discrimination laws, which are legion. You know, it's, not, it's not very popular in the world today, but that's what he's going to talk about. Anyway, so uh, I don't know if it's going to be broadcast on C-SPAN, you'll probably see on YouTube, the, uh, the committee puts it up on YouTube, but that's just on Tuesday. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is, um, you know, I've been, uh, dealing with the financial media here in New York City for probably about 15 years. Um, and I think I know just about everybody um, in the major mainstream media that writes about economics and economic policy and the stock market. 
And it, it, so these are nice people. I mean, I deal with them all the time. They're smart people, but unfortunately, they they remain clueless. I mean, it's like you're trying to talk to them, trying to tell them the truth about what we what where, what we see going on in the economy, what the real forces are, and it's in one ear and out the next. And the, the the biggest problem is that I'm trying to tell them that an economy doesn't grow because people spend. And that's what everybody thinks. Like you, if you look in any, it turns to on, but any economic debate, the idea is, well, we've got to get the economy going, we've got to boost GDP, we've got, to, we've got to get people spending. And I think when it comes to economics, most people don't understand this. They think, of, yeah, spending, that's good, that's great jobs. People don't spend, they, they buy things, the stores stay open, the stores are open, all goods, and there's stuff we can buy. And actually, that's, that's like saying that one side will stop running. If, if you really understand economics, which is not very hard, in fact, this is all carefully illustrated in my book, How an Economy Goes in Life Graphics. Spending does not create economics. It's kind of like, you know, we have money in this system, and money is a fairly new um, uh, development in economic terms. But if you take the money, and the money is very necessary, it's a lubricant for economic transactions. Money makes things go smoothly. But money is just a conduit. It's not, it's, not the, it's not the engine. It's kind of like your car doesn't go, and you decide, well, it's not lubricated enough. It just pour all oil all over and pretty soon you go. If the engine doesn't work, it doesn't matter how much oil you pour on it in terms of money, it doesn't matter. So, but what really makes an economy go is production. Producing more stuff. It's very simple, you know, and Tom Woods is going to hear later, and he's got a great uh, lecture about this. It's like, it's all the quality of the tools you have, and how, how efficient your labor is. If you took away all our tools, if you took away all of our machines, everything we've got, and left us with hands and feet, the human being, the human condition, would be no different from any other primate. We could not, we, no matter how smart we are, if we don't have a good tool, if we don't have a good machine, our economy does not exist. And in history, thank you, I'm pressing back. Um, the history of, 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 a, of the human economy is a history of improvement of technology. Each technology builds on the next, builds on the next. It really started about, a, about 100 and 220 years ago in 1770 with the invention of the steam engine. That's what kicked it into overdrive. And the better our tools get, the better we, and tools come from capital formation, investment, design, innovation, build greater tools, then we can take the limited amount of resources we have, and everything in the economy is limited. You know, except for air. Well, even that's limited. But just about everything else is limited. And the question, and then our labor is limited. And the more efficient we can get by using our limited resources and our limited um, uh, our labor to produce more goods and services that people want, that's what makes an economy grow. Money has nothing to do with it. Printing money has nothing to do with it. Credit has nothing to do with it. It's just how, how are you going to build better tools? And how are you going to, how are you going to expand production? Uh, and the kind of, the kind of uh, um, uh, prosperity we, 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 that we developed in this country in, in the 19th and 20th century was unprecedented. By 1920 and 1930, you had living standards in this country that had never been seen before on the face of, on the face of the earth. And that was done without big government, without the income tax, without workers' employment uh, regulations, without Social Security, without the welfare state. That's what created the wealth. Since 1930, 1940, or so, what have we been doing? We've been dissipating our wealth. I was watching, I was debating with somebody the other day, and, um, you know, this is a left wing guy, and as far as he was concerned, prosperity came to, came to being sometime in 1952 as a result of strong labor trade unions in the United States. That's not how it happened. I mean, that's what started our decline. We had built a level of wealth in this country. Um, that was that was off the charts. Now, yes, the, the Industrial Revolution had it, had, it, had its low moments. Um, Charles Dickens uh, noted quite a few of them. Um, there was certainly some some you know, bad things for child labor and things like that in this country and still around the world now. But people forget. I mean, child labor had been going on since the dawn of time. I mean, before the Industrial Revolution, every kid worked unless you were a member of the nobility. They all worked on farms. The fact that we can transition from that into an industrial economy in 20 or 30 years. We invented the middle class in this country where everybody had not just not just a, a home and a house and electricity, but a washing machine. And one parent could work and support a family. My grandfather came to this country in, well, in 1890. He moved to, he moved to uh, New Haven, Connecticut in 1910. 
He was a carpenter. He was a skilled carpenter, but he was a carpenter. He supported a middle-class lifestyle. His wife did not work. He retired. He had a vacation home. It was a modest vacation home, but it was a vacation home. And he did all that on a working man's salary with no income taxes and no government freedom by his name. That is impossible today. Despite all of our, uh, all the struggles for welfare state, that, 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 that's impossible. And if you understand economics and what makes an economy grow, you can figure out what will happen. Unfortunately, um, people don't understand that. So we talk about, you know, us, you know, changing the Constitution and changing the way we're, we're, we, we govern ourselves. Until we change the animal, until we, uh, we, more people understand what's going on and what makes the world economy grow and what creates prosperity, it doesn't matter. It was spoken, it, no change will be able to take over because people won't understand it. So, that's all I gotta say. Go check out the book, How to Comedy the World More Crash. It's illustrated, it's got pictures. You read it in three hours, your kids will like it, your friends will like it, and um, CMTV. Thanks a lot.